One opinion poll said 69% of people <laughs> under 30 said they, could, they would vote for a socialist for president. So socialism defined, you know, the, the classic definition in the early 20th century was government ownership of the means of production. So when you see uh, countries becoming more and more socialist, it means their governments have been taking over various means of production. When, when the British nationalized all, all the, uh, the commanding heights of their economy after World War II, they became more and more socialist. Uh, and so they didn't become totally uh, socialist in, in the central planning sense like the Soviet Union, but they moved, uh, they lurched in the direction of socialism. And now in, uh, in Friedrich Hayek's famous book, The Road to Serfdom, uh, in the 1976 edition, uh, he, he, he argued that over the years, you know, between the early 20th century and, and then, mid-70s, the definition of socialism had changed. He said, that, he said that it changed to include the institutions of the welfare state and the progressive income tax. Because, uh, in his words, uh, the the goal, the ostensible goal, was always egalitarianism, or equal, the pursuit of equality through forceful uh, governmental coercion, and the means just changed. He said the original means were the government ownership of the means means of production, and that didn't work out too well, and so they switched to a different means: uh, the welfare state and a progressive income tax. The group of socialists who came to America in the 1940s who are known as cultural Marxists, uh, their theory was that uh, the reason why the Europeans did not voluntarily embrace socialism was that they were too uh, wedded to the institutions and ideas of Western civilization, including the ideas of capitalism, uh, in particular, and private property and so forth, and Christianity. They were too wedded to, uh, to Christianity. Therefore, the ideas and institutions of Western civilization and the ideas of Christianity must be destroyed uh, in order to have socialist utopia. And that, uh, in my view, is why you see all these attacks on the traditional family, uh, on, always on capitalism for sure, and just... Uh, you know, the tearing down of monuments and the, the painting over of murals and things like that. These are all attacks on the institutions of Western civilization, uh, and it's all part of the game plan. In the 1989 edition of Paul Samuelson's famous textbook, the Principles of Economics textbook, which was the biggest selling textbook in the world from the 1940s until the 1980s, he predicted that, this was 1989, he predicted that by, by 2000, the Soviet economy would be bigger than the U.S. economy. That's, that's what mainstream economics was teaching us college students in 1989 uh, on, the, on the verge of the total collapse of the Soviet Union. Country after country, Africa after, after independence, uh, they adopted Soviet uh, socialism and central planning. Their logo was, quote, only socialism can save Africa. Forty years later, the Af these African countries were poorer than they were under colonialism. Venezuela today, uh, need I say more? England, after World War II, adopted their version of socialism, Fabian socialism. Uh, they nationalized uh, uh, many of the major industries. By the 1970s, the whole world was talking about the British disease because they had ruined their economy, uh, and they, you know, and they, and and that's what got that's uh, what led to the uh, the election of Margaret Thatcher, who promised, uh, who was a student of Hayek, not a formal student, but she read she read Hayek, and uh, and she uh, turned things around quite a bit. Argentina adopted its version of socialism in the 1940s and, and 50s under Perón. And then, uh, and, and he, of course, quickly ruined the Argentine economy and was replaced with a coup. Uh, and Argentina, uh, like all these other countries, once uh, they destroyed their, the productive capacity of their country, they tried to bail, out, bail themselves out by printing money. And Argentina, by the 1980s, had 12,000% price inflation. Chile, the same thing. The country of Chile... Uh, uh, adopted socialism in the 1970s. They ended up with 746% inflation in an economy that simply stood still, just, just destroyed it. And then they were, uh, uh, that government was overthrown by a, a re, sort of a repressive regime uh, after that. So not a, not a happy history of country after country. And you might have noticed that a lot of these countries are de democracies. 
uh, uh, Friedrich Bastiat wrote in his famous essay, The Law, that there's really no difference. If, if the government imposes a uniform policy on the whole country, a dictator can do it and a legislature can do it. So there's really no difference. You know, you can impose socialism with a legislature like Venezuela did. Uh, you, don't, you don't need dictatorship to have socialism. You don't need the Soviet Union to ruin your economy. Hayek is famous for what he called the knowledge problem, the fact that it's uh, uh, unthinkable that a human mind or even a hundred human minds working with the most powerful computer in the world could possibly possess and utilize all of the information that the millions of workers and consumers and business managers and investors and, and, and on and on have that they use in their daily lives. It's, uh, it's a pretense. His, uh, he called it the pretense of, of knowledge. And then there's also something called, you'd call, I would call the public choice problem involved with socialism. Uh, the way Hayek put it was, under socialism, the only power worth having is political power. That is, the way to acquire uh, things to make yourself better off is through politics and political connection, bribery, and, and just plain old politics. Uh, you can advance by educating yourself, being a producer, being an entrepreneur, serving your fellow man by providing him or her with valued goods and services. That's illegal. That's you know, The government is control. You're not in control. You're not allowed to do that. And so the way to, to succeed is through politics. Most people don't know that fascism is a form of socialism. Uh, fascism, socialism, communism, it's all the same gang as far as I'm concerned. They're all collectivists. Uh, the Soviets, uh, the name of their country was the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. They didn't call themselves the Union of Soviet Communist Republics. Communism was the utopian ideal that they hoped to achieve in 500 years. But in the meantime, they're all socialists. They call themselves socialists, so it's the same thing. So don't fall for that. And, and, and of course, Hayek in The Road to Serfdom point out that all the fascists of the 20th century, Mussolini, Stalin, and the rest, they, were all start, they all started out as socialists. And of course, Nazi, the word Nazi is national socialism. Uh, so the Russians called themselves international socialists. The German socialists called themselves national socialists. But they were all socialists, just, just a different variety of socialism. You know, it's like, you know, I'm, I'm a murderer who likes to use guns and he likes to use knives, you know, we're, but we're the same thing. We're both murderers. Hayek noted in the, road, in the Road to Serfdom, he said this, the dominant feature of, uh, the, of Nazi Germany, he's referring to Nazi Germany, was a fierce hatred of anything capitalistic, individual profit-seeking, large-scale enterprise, banks, joint stock companies, department stores, international finance and loan capital, and the system of what they called interest slavery. They, they, they equated uh, charging a bank charging you interest uh, for a loan as slavery. Uh, Hayek pointed out in the road to serfdom that in Germany, they, they nationalized, about, uh, the Nazis did, about half of all industry. And then the other half was so heavily regimented and controlled and regulated that it was de facto nationalized. And that's probably the big difference between Soviet socialism and the German and the Nazi socialism is that fascism allowed a degree of private ownership, but it was heavily controlled and dictated. Uh, you know, what it would do would be dictated by the government, by the state. So, so ownership was not really private ownership uh, since the state controlled everything. Inequality historically is far worse under socialism than under capitalism. Uh, if you read about Venezuela today, for example, I read an a article in the Wall Street Journal that said uh, Hugo Chavez's daughter, who's in her 30s, has a net worth of about $4 billion. And as far as I know, she never started a business. I don't think she's one of the original founders of Microsoft or anything like that. And, $4 billion, and the Wall Street Journal also said that the former finance minister of Venezuela, who I think they said he now lives in Switzerland, had a net worth of $11 billion. Okay, and and of course, even to this day, you can read articles in the, in the American news media about the political elite in Venezuela still living high on the hog. They have their country clubs and they have their food, and and you also read about people killing dogs and cats uh, to feed their children. You know, the normal, the ordinary people in Venezuela, and it's always been like that. The the people who ran the Soviet Union had multiple uh, vacation homes all over all over the place, and and accumulated great wealth, and the masses were equally indigent. 
uh, in country after country, uh, you see that uh, the the African potentates who adopted socialist uh, socialism and became uh, dictators after independence in the 1960s, they all lived uh, like kings and queens, and while, while the people starved. And so the, the whole business of so, uh, we need socialism to create more uh, equality uh, is is fraudulent. It's uh, it's never it's never been true. It's never been true like that. Not that equality is even a desirable thing, because of course we are all different. Uh, we're all different in uh, in thousands of different ways. And the only way you can uh, move in the direction of trying to force equality is with a totalitarian society. And of course, you can never do that. You can never have equality because human beings are not equal. As uh, uh, Rabbi Daniel Lappin, who gave a talk here some years ago um, on this point, he said that uh, he made the point that you know God made all human beings. This is a Jewish rabbi. He said God made all human beings unique. Just like he made all stones unique, stones are all different. Every stone is different. You're not you can't find two stones that are the same. But humans can make bricks identical. You, we can manufacture bricks, you know, like the bricks in a house or a building. You can make those identical. And uh, he posed the question: Do you want to think of yourself more as a stone or a brick? And and that's that's what egalitarianism is about: is making us all into identical bricks.